me, as you guys are watching the coverage of this and seeing people try to understand what's happening, give me your quick lesson that you just wish people had as they're trying to interpret everything. Well, that's a great, I know. Well, that's a great, great question. I would say uh, for me, for me, two things. First of all, the challenge of understanding these events in a balanced, in a, with a balanced perspective and avoiding the temptation to understand these events with a one dimensional approach to the problem. There are some very strong, intense, passionate, emotionally driven, partisan, one dimensional views. And these views, regardless of what direction they're coming from, they tend to ignore the complexity of the conflict. So that's the first thing. The other thing for me is the timing. And in some ways, you know, the, uh, the, especially the military exchange between Hamas and the Israeli army, it's happened before, but the timing this time, because just before the, not, not only the escalation, but also the original conflicts began, it, you know, the Israeli government, Israeli politics was on the cusp of taking a, a really remarkable step forward. There was, they were in the process of forming a new government, sans Bibi Netanyahu, which was going to bring together left wing and right wing, and also more importantly, was going to include for the first time uh, you know, an Israeli Arab party as part of the ruling government. And, and, th and this coalition was, was poised to look beyond ideological differences and actually begin to solve some problems, you know, basic day-to-day -day problems for Jews and Arabs in Israel and others as well. And, and, and this coalition was, in some ways, it was an outgrowth of this sense of camaraderie or, or cooperation from the pandemic where, you know, you keep, I keep reading the statistic that 20% of frontline doctors and nurses during the pandemic for the last year were Israeli Arabs and Palestinians. And so, so this, the, this moment was about to take place and this conflict, it, it's possible that it, up, it upended it. So that is very disappointing. Yeah, I have to agree with Howie. I mean, on, on the one hand, uh, we're historians. And so for us, context and uh, a broader scope of, uh, of understanding uh, things uh, is, is really baked into the proverbial cake. Uh, we don't look at things just from the standpoint of what's happened in the last uh, 48 hours or the last uh, week or so. Uh, we're looking at a history uh, that goes back and we're, we're dealing with communities that have a very good sense of that history and memory. And if you were to go ahead and uh, name a year, uh, that year has resonance uh, and, and different narratives for both sides. They, they look at these things sometimes in such different ways that you'd be uh, wondering if you're talking about the same event, uh, as a matter of fact. And at the same time, we're also human beings who are responding and reacting to uh, imagery uh, and stories uh, that are very emotionally uh, uh, gut-wrenching. And uh, as Howie said, to try to go ahead and, uh, and maintain a balance, which, which today is even a contentious word. Uh, the idea of accusations uh, that uh, to even recognize the existence of another narrative uh, is, is uh, causing people to then uh, make uh, certain accusations, uh, make certain aspersions about people who are trying to gain a full understanding to this issue. So uh, not very helpful uh, as, uh, as these kinds of tense situations are. Uh, but again, uh, looking at it through, as, as Howie said, what is uh, the cause of this current situation? And it seems to me that there are really three uh, major issues going on here. One is uh, the uh, eviction of uh, Palestinians from one community in East Jerusalem, from Sheikh Jarrah, a longstanding issue. Uh, which was reaching its uh, sort of culmination in the uh, Supreme Court with a decision pending that seems to have been postponed indefinitely. Uh, the other was on one of the holiest days of uh, the Muslim calendar in Ramadan, uh, the, uh, the attack on uh, the third holiest uh, mosque in Islam, the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, with uh, tear gas and stun guns uh, stun grenades uh, was also then seen as just another 
uh, escalation. And then, of course, uh, what has been going on now in, in uh, both Gaza as, as well as in uh, Tel Aviv. And the point that, uh, that Howie was making about how all things are political and how we were really at this moment for change uh, within the Israeli domestic politics, uh, one has to wonder then, uh, were, was this partially orchestrated? Was there a, uh, a political agenda to uh, fan flames that uh, were uh, already at any given moment uh, on, on very dry, uh, uh, dry tinder? Absolutely. I, I mean, orchestrated or not, these events could not have been timed better more to the benefit of Bibi Netanyahu and Hamas. I mean, they are the principal beneficiaries here. So yeah, I mean, uh, it, the timing was awful for everyone except for them. Yeah, I think if we would have written a script uh, out of some kind of a Tom Clancy novel, this probably would have been the way that we would have, uh, we would have written it. It definitely could have, and I, you know, and I would just add, in terms of the, the of the events, the context that Saeed presented. One of the thing is that this this year, coincidentally, Yom Yerushalayim, you know, the the day that Israelis and Jews commemorate the the the, the taking of Jerusalem in 1967, it, you know, it, it coincided with the end of Ramadan this year, and that hasn't happened in a very long time, or maybe ever. I don't know, but so tensions were high on both sides, and on the and on the Jewish side, this they, you know especially uh, right wing Jews, uh, the 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 ultra zealous patriot patriots use that day to uh, to put forward a sentiment that Arabs should be expelled, Arabs should be evicted. That doesn't that 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 doesn't re reflect the view of most Israelis, but they were the loudest, most conspicuous, and most boisterous. And this is also part of the immediate context because one of the changes that happened in Israeli politics in the most recent elections is for the first time there were uh, there were representatives of Kahan of Kahanist parties in the Knesset. Uh, two, two, two in particular, and uh, th this this is a game changer because this mentality has been there. But when you have actual representation in, in you know in the in the legislature in the House of Parliament, it empowers this point of view. So it became a couple notches less marginalized within Israeli society, even though most Israelis left or right, are, find, it, find it appalling. In fact, if you go back a couple of decades, one of the last instructions that Menachem Begin, uh, Likud prime minister, left when he left the government was, don't let the Kahanists into the house. Please don't let these people in. If you do, there's going to be trouble. And the, uh, the, the events of the last few weeks basically proved that to be prophetic. For people who don't know what the Kahanists are, what do they believe and what is this fight that's going on that may be leading to all of this? Uh, uh, Kahanists, you, you, you know, your, your basic Israeli attitude uh, toward minorities, as it's, you know, as it's codified or it's written into the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel, is that the State of Israel needs to be not only a Jewish state, but also a democratic state. It guarantees full civil rights to all people, regardless of religion, regardless of ethnicity, Jewish, Arab, Muslim, Christian, everybody. And first Zionist thinkers and then Israeli thinkers across the spectrum, you know, from Ben-Gurion on the left to Begin on the right, all agree with that. Kahanists are a far-right party who don't agree with that. They, they're much, they, they are concerned only that the state be a Jewish state and not necessarily a democratic state. In other words, they're okay with it being a democratic, as long as it doesn't impede in any way it being a Jewish state. And Kahana himself, you know, Mayor Kahana, sort of the founder of this party and the, the, the champion of this point of view, who was, who was, he was assassinated in the early 1990s, he, he, he actually espoused uh, expelling Arabs from Israel and cert certainly Arabs from the territories taken in 1967. So it's a view that was marginalized. He himself was expelled from the Knesset. He was banned from the state of Israel. Uh, but it's a view that, uh, you know, in part due to the support that that Netanyahu gave to these parties as a way to building a coalition. In the last few years, this once marginal, radical, extreme point of view has been empowered and has, has gained influence. And uh, it's unfortunate. I think people also don't understand why 
Palestinians live in the Gaza Strip and how how they can't live and how they can't leave and they can't trade. Uh, what should people know about that and how that fuels this as well? Well, I think in part, and I mean, you, you have to, again, look at the timing of this just a few days before uh, this current flare up, uh, there was a report issued by um, Human Rights Watch, which categorized uh, the condition of uh, the Palestinian territories as essentially being an apartheid state. Uh, that got, of course, quite a bit of, of pushback from uh, the Israeli government. Uh, but of course, it was seen uh, as a validation from, uh, from many Arabs, uh, both within um, Israel, uh, the Palestinian territories, and, and uh, elsewhere around the world. And uh, irrespective of, uh, of how the categorization is made, uh, clearly there was a connection to then uh, the situation that Howie mentioned that since 1967, uh, Gaza and the Palestinian territories have been uh, under uh, Israeli authority. Now, there has been some kind of quasi administration on the part of uh, the Palestinian Authority in, uh, in the West Bank and Hamas in uh, Gaza. Uh, but in essence, when it comes to borders, when it comes to uh, goods going in and out, uh, when it comes to, as you mentioned, freedom of movement, uh, these are still um, regarded by Israel as matters of a, of a national security uh, component and uh, thus its uh, involvement within that. So uh, on the one hand, we can say that this really goes back to then uh, the conditions uh, in, uh, in the territories as a result of, uh, of an occupation. But I would say that in recent times, what has really changed uh, the dynamics is social media. Uh, now people have access uh, a, in an unprecedented way and in real time uh, to images, to stories and narratives, uh, which are bringing uh, things not just to uh, as close as one's living room uh, uh, television set, uh, but to one's phone. And so as a result of it, you see that there is a heightened awareness uh, and uh, whenever there's anything with an emotional uh, element to it, uh, we're gonna find that that's going to be heightened under these situations. And I would just add, I, I agree with Sayed completely in terms of social media is that uh, social media, it, it makes it possible for people to, uh, to understand these events, to learn about these events in a highly selective way. So it's harder. It's you have to really look for the big picture in order to get it. And just by, just by, from social media, you're going to get a highly slanted point of view unless you're determined not to. What are some of the slanted points of view on social media that you really think people need more context for to understand? I'll suggest one, you know, and I think this isn't just on social media, I, I have to say, this is a point of view that's gotten a, that's gotten a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it comes up a lot. It even it, this is even a point of view put forth by John Oliver, who I normally agree with. I love him. Um, but he, and, and for the most part, I thought his analysis of the conflict was pretty good. Um, and I mentioned him simply because not, you know, not that he's a newsman per se, but he is someone who has a lot of audience and a lot of people get their information from, from his show and from him. But he, he, he made an interesting juxtaposition. And Saeed, I'd be curious to hear what you think about this as well. And feel free to push back if you want. Um, but he, he noted, he, he, uh, he noted a, uh, an asymmetry in terms of the conflict between Israel and Hamas, there's a, a military and a technological asymmetry, meaning that uh, the weaponry that uh, the Israeli army uses is far superior. Uh, and so the Israeli army was able to inflict a lot more casualties. And there is no question about that, that many more Palestinians in Gaza have been killed than Israelis have been killed. And I think that military and technological asymmetry is spot on. What I think gets lost, it doesn't get as much play, is that despite this military asymmetry, that doesn't necessarily connote a moral asymmetry. In other words, true, Hamas lacks the military and techno technological ability to inflict as much damage, to kill as many people, but it's not for lack of trying. They shot several thousand missiles at Israeli civilians, and yes, most of them didn't land, thankfully, but the fact that fewer Israelis were killed was not, it reflects nothing about the intent of Hamas, and I think the intent here suggests that this, uh, Despite the, 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 despite the military and technological asymmetry of the conflict, there is a moral symmetry here. Um, both, both sides are taking actions that is winding up with the killing of civilians. 
Yeah, and I look, I agree with that, Howie. I, I, and and it's one of the reasons why uh, sometimes I find it unhelpful to get into an argument about uh, or a debate and discussion about morality, because again, and this is what's happening on social media, is that uh, people are trying to outmoralize the other side. Uh, and uh, as, as, as Shakespeare once said, you know, a pox on all your houses uh, sometimes becomes uh, the, uh, uh, the conclusion to be reached. There are uh, questions that come up when you have uh, military capabilities. Uh, sometimes the more sophisticated your, your forces are, uh, the greater the responsibility it would seem to avoid uh, uh, the escalation um, or uh, the kind of disproportionate uh, impact on civilians. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case uh, in Gaza. Uh, now, uh, we're talking about an area that's about 140 square miles. So that at its uh, narrowest point is about three miles. But generally speaking, it's about uh, you know, seven miles uh, wide by about 20 miles long. It's not a very big, uh, big area at all. And it's understandable that certain things can be concentrated, meaning civilian and, uh, and other kinds of, uh, of areas. Uh, but what we're seeing happening in Gaza and the imagery, again, that's being broadcast on social media is causing quite a bit of consternation. Uh, the, the most recent uh, controversy seems to be around a, a media building uh, housing uh, Al Jazeera and, and uh, Associated Press. And this has, of course, reached even the corridors of power in Washington, where uh, the Secretary of State, uh, uh, Tony Blinken, said, I haven't seen any evidence to point that Hamas uh, had a presence in the building, uh, while uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, assured uh, President uh, Biden that uh, Israeli intelligence shared with American intelligence uh, to the opposite of that. So we have all of these things that are being processed in real time. Uh, and of course, there are conspiracy theories abound uh, when it comes to this. On the point of Hamas uh, um, uh, launching missiles against uh, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, I believe the statement was that they were doing this in retaliation for what happened at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. But it seems as though it's, uh, it's a rather misguided uh, uh, destination for the missiles, at least from um, a, a, a tactical position. Forget about, of course, the, the idea that it's uh, civilian targets and, and again, the morality. But it would seem as though uh, the majority of uh, the Jewish community, uh, both in Israel, uh, especially in a place like Tel Aviv and uh, overseas, uh, tend to look at uh, the settler movement, which uh, was uh, behind some of the conflict in, uh, in Jerusalem uh, recently, um, not with the, with the most favorable lens, uh, shall we say. And it seemed as though the uh, attack on, on Tel Aviv, uh, Howie, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems as though it probably um, uh, was something that then moved otherwise ambivalent um, uh, uh, parts of the Jewish community into almost a forced sense of uh, support for Netanyahu and even for the, the center right or farther right in, uh, in Israel. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Attacking Tel Aviv is crossing a red line if only because most Israelis in Tel Aviv don't uh, uh, oppose this conflict. Most are against the occupation. I mean, you're attacking you're attacking those Israelis who are the most likely to want to make some kind of alliance. I mean, they live, yes, they live in fear of Hamas, but that, that was a tactical error, no question. I, I think what, it, it points to one of the larger issues. I think what, the real quandary, I mean, to build on what Saeed said, the real quandary for the Israeli military, it being a conventional army fighting much more or less a guerrilla army is that, you know, typically, and this isn't just this comic, this is in general, a conventional army loses if it doesn't win a guerrilla army wins if it doesn't lose. So all Hamas has to do is basically remain Hamas when this is over, regardless of how many of how many Palestinian Hamas are supposedly protecting wind up dead, as long as they can still declare themselves as Hamas, they win. And the flip, the flip side is true of, the, of Israel and the Israeli military, unless they were able to somehow obliterate Hamas from the face of the earth, which of course is impossible, it, you, you can't really declare all out victory. So that, that's the frustration. Uh, the quandary for the Israeli side is how do you fight a battle like this? I mean, there is embedded into the Israeli military psyche. There's, there is a notion of restraint. 
there is a notion of trying to minimize civ civilian casualties, but what do you do when the, the weapons being fired at you, at least in some cases, are embedded within civilian populations against the will of the civilian population? Uh, it, it makes it very difficult to wage this in a conventional way. Is that why it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, you don't believe that anybody's being transparent about their motives, that this is more political than it is about the incidents that are being pointed to as the cause by the people involved. I don't think it's only political. I think it's in part. There is, I, I think there is a political dimension to it, but by the same token, it, it, the, the same other dynamics are at play. From the Israeli side, there is a sense of there is a concern for security and a, and a concern about what Hamas has done in the past, what they might do in the future, the dangers of empowering them. So there's, there's always that security concern, not only for, for not only for Tel Aviv and for Jerusalem, but especially for those Israelis who live close to the border of Gaza, who are especially vulnerable because that's where the rockets can really hit. And uh, on, on the Hamas side of the conflict, of course, there is this ongoing concern. They, they are waging this in part. I mean, their tactical errors uh, and, the moral, uh, and the moral dimension aside, they are waging this in the name of achieving some kind of Palestinian statehood. So these things are, are also present. So I think political is part of it, but I don't think it's all of it. So um, is there an existential threat to Israel when you have, uh, you said the, the, the majority of the people believed in democracy and inclusion and and now they have these far right views that may be motive uh, in the leadership that might be motivating this is how how does israel move forward and get out of this uh, when it sounds like um the decisions might not be in line with what the people want and and it this could be a very transformative event Maybe. I, I think that radical right, that extremist, extremist right, I think, at least I hope, it's, it's still it's less marginal than it was, but still marginal. Uh, and even though they'll be part of the government, they're not going to be running the government, whether Bibi is still prime minister or whether it's somebody else. Uh, so uh, I, I mean, as, as far as transforming, I, I think from Israel's point of view, this isn't really going to change much of anything, with one exception, is that this is the first, first of these kinds of, the first these kinds of conflicts where Israeli Arabs were actively participating, and that is a game changer. You know, in towns like Lod and Bat Yam and a few other Israeli cities and towns, the presumption before this conflict was that the, the Jews and Arabs living there we're living there with relative stability and relative coexistence and cooperation. And, you know, it's harder to see that now. So the, yes, the, the, ex, the exchange of missiles and, and military retaliation is gonna end and it's gonna be a ceasefire, but the real mess that's gonna be need, that's gonna need to be cleaned up is restoring some kind of trust and cooperation between Jews and Arabs in Israel. And I think that's going to be very difficult. The next government is really going to have its hands full trying to simply restore that kind of trust, which uh, I think this came as a surprise to many people, though, not, though certainly not to all people. And you know, I say in the same way in this country, we're working very hard to restore trust in government it, that, uh, uh, in, a, in a different setting, there is going to be that task of restoring trust, not only in government, but also between Jews and Arabs. Yeah. I think when you're asking the question about, is it an existential threat? Uh, I think that can only really be answered if you can define your existence. And I think right now in Israel, there is a real uh, crisis of identity. And you're seeing this happening within the political ideologies of, uh, uh, of being a Jewish and a democratic state. And uh, I find that the internal politics of, of, uh, of Israel right now are far more controversial than what would I think be a far, relatively speaking, easier uh, solution to dealing with, with the Palestinian question. Uh, right now, all of these kinds of uh, maneuvers are, are based on how to deal with the settler movement, uh, I, I, Howie is certainly uh, very optimistic in hoping that it remains at the level of marginality that it is. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it seems as though it certainly finds validation in these saying, aha, see, Arabs can't be trusted, Arabs can't coexist, 
uh, even the ones that are living uh, within uh, within uh, Israel itself, not in um, in the Palestinian territories. And so that is now starting to gain a certain level of traction. If there are those circuit breakers within uh, Israeli domestic politics to take a step back and say, look, this is just not working, it's not healthy. Uh, we're finding ourselves going from one violent conflict to another. Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different outcome. And on the Palestinian side, uh, you've got uh, the Palestinian Authority, which hasn't held elections in 15 years. So uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is 88 years old, uh, not getting any younger. Uh, and then, of course, you've got Hamas. So you've got two um, political models, uh, neither of which is, uh, is really very healthy. Uh, either for Palestinians or for uh, developing the kind of trust that Howie's talking about between uh, Israel and Palestine. There needs to, at the very least, be a ceasefire uh, uh, immediately, uh, and there needs to be a de-escalation. Uh, it would be helpful if uh, the United States used its uh, political capital in the region to do so, um, or if not, it shouldn't be then a, uh, a, a, a barricade uh, to it. And I think that there needs to be some kind of humanitarian uh, uh, aid uh, that is provided, uh, which would require a kind of a rebuilding of, uh, of, of Gaza. Uh, and then also uh, moving toward, uh, again, some kind of a political conciliation uh, among people who have to realize that neither side is going anywhere. 